It's our first time in this stunning country, yet everything just feels so familiar. I know this might sound crazy, but it's like we've been here before. When we first started planning for the adventure, we thought that 11 days would be more than enough time to quench our thirst for this beautiful country. How wrong we were. There's just so much to see here. I doubt whether a lifetime would be enough to see everything. And when I say everything, keep in mind that less than 1% of its ancient artefacts have been discovered so far. This short film captures just part of that 1% as we embark on a 1200 km journey from the southern village of Abu Simbel to the thriving metropolis of Cairo. Along the way we get to visit remarkable temples, exquisitely decorated tombs and magnificent statues. And of course we get to hang out with the charming locals who welcomed us with open arms into this beautiful country they call home. We start our adventure in southern Egypt at the village of Abu Simbel. Wow, what an amazing introduction to Egypt. As we approach the site, two massive rock art temples completely fill our field of vision. I don't think it really matters how much you prepare yourself for Abba Symbol. You're still going to be absolutely starstruck when you first see the temples in real life. I find myself just standing here with my mouth wide open, staring in wonder at these breathtaking historic sculptures. It's just crazy to think that we're looking at temples that were built like 3,000 years ago. The Great Temple is dedicated to the gods Amun-Ra, Ra, Rakti and Ptah, but it was also erected to demonstrate the might of the Egyptian Empire and in particular King Ramesses II. The entire temple is absolutely amazing. However, for me, there were two key features that really stood out. The first one was this hyperstyle hall. You can see here it's got eight huge pillars of the deified Ramesses. The second is a small sanctuary right at the back of the temple. The four seated figures are the god Raharakti, the deified Ramesses II, and the gods Amun Ra and Ptah. Just to the right of the Great Temple is another temple which Ramesses II dedicated to the god Hathor and his chief wife Queen Nefertari. This stunning temple is said to be a symbol of love between the Pharaoh Ramesses and the true love of his life, the beautiful Queen Nefertari. About 280 kilometers north of Abu Simbel, lies our next destination, the village of Aswan. Sailing on the Nile in a felucca with a cool afternoon breeze is pretty special. Especially when you're entertained by this talented group of locals. Just up there, on the patio, is where Agatha Christie sat to write Death on the Nile. Our next destination is the Philae Temple on Ajulkia Island. It was originally located on the nearby island of Philae, however the new dam posed a threat to its existence, so it was pulled apart block by block 
and relocated to its current location. The temple is an important symbol in Egyptian culture as it represents the power of Isis as a protector and patron goddess. Records show that the temple passed through several hands and religions, going back and forth between the Egyptians, the Romans, and even the Greeks. Looking at the walls, you can see where the early Christians destroyed and disfigured many of the Egyptian statues and hieroglyphs. They even transformed the temple into a church at one stage. Okay, we're back on the Nile and we're heading 41 kilometers down river to our next destination, the magnificent Temple of Komombo. It was constructed during the Ptolemaic Dynasty between 180 and 47 BC. The construction is quite unique because of its double design. The southern side of the temple is dedicated to the crocodile god Sobek, who represented fertility and the creator of the world. The northern side of the temple was dedicated to the falcon god Horus. Situated right on the bank of the Nile, the twin temples remain absolutely glorious despite over a millennia of use, abuse and restoration. We were lucky enough to have Komombo all to ourselves on this day. Just look at the stunning craftsmanship of the hieroglyphs on these palm fringed columns. Sixty-four kilometres downstream, we arrive at our next destination, the majestic temple of Edfu. Located on the west bank of the Nile, it's one of the best preserved shrines in Egypt. So here we are in the temple of Edfu. Pretty amazing. These columns, just incredible. The construction of the temple was started between 246 and 221 BC by Ptolemy III. However, it wasn't completed for about another 180 years by Cleopatra VII's father, Ptolemy XII. It's hard to believe, but just over 200 years ago, the temple was completely covered by sand and rubble. The massive 36 metre high pylon is guarded by two huge and splendid granite statues of Horus as a falcon. Just past the inner hypostyle hall lies the temple laboratory. This is where the necessary incense and perfumes were brewed and their recipes archived on the walls. As we move through the Hall of Offerings, we come to the holiest region of the temple, known as the Sanctuary. This room contains a black granite shrine that was dedicated to Nectanabo II, who ruled Egypt between 358 and 340 BC. The Temple of Edfu is the second largest in Egypt. It's also referred to as the Temple of Horus and is considered by many to be the most beautiful and well-preserved 
of all the temples in Egypt. We sail a further two hours downstream to our next destination, Esna. As you can see here, it sits about nine metres below the buildings that surround it. It was first constructed by King Tutmosis III and is an absolutely beautiful piece of remarkable and enchanting architecture. Just look at the stunning colours on these towering columns. Just being on the Nile is simply incredible at any time. But when you get to do it on this magnificent vessel, well, it's just the icing on the cake. The Sanctuary Sunboat 4, which is owned and managed by Abercrombie and Kent, catered to our every need especially our appetites. During the night, our boat sails a further 58 kilometers downriver to our next destination, Luxor. Luxor is probably one of the most densely populated archeological sites in all of Egypt. Today's adventure starts in the Valley of the Queens. We were told by our guide, Muhammad, this tomb, owned by Queen Nefertari, is one of the most impressive in the valley. And after spending just over 45 minutes wandering around this magnificent monument, I can certainly see why. Discovered in just 1904, it's often referred to as the Sistine Chapel of Ancient Egypt. The tomb itself is primarily focused on the Queen's life. We can see here a painting which shows Nefertari coming before Thoth, the god of writing and literacy, which suggests that Nefertari may have been a scribe. The ceiling represents the heavens and is painted in dark blue with a myriad of golden five-pointed stars. By contemporary standards, the real value of the paintings found within the tomb is that they are one of the best preserved and most detailed sources showing an ancient Egyptian's journey towards the afterlife. I'm not sure if it was the intricate details of the wall paintings, the amazing colour of the images, but we all came away from this stunning tomb feeling quite emotional. A beautiful resting place for a much loved queen. As we head towards our next destination, we come across these two 18 metre stone statues depicting Pharaoh Amenhotep III. Constructed in 1350 BC, they weigh 720 tonnes each and are made from material quarried near modern day Cairo. At this weight, they are far too heavy to have been put on a boat and shipped up the Nile which means the 675 kilometer journey from Cairo to Luxor must have been across the desert. We're back on the bus and we're traveling a further 10 minutes up the road to our next site, 
a desolate valley known as the Valley of the Kings. The first tomb we enter belongs to Seti I. He was the second king of the 19th dynasty. Seti is the father of the great Ramesses II and was on the throne of Egypt between 1294 and 1279 BC. At almost 138 metres long, the tomb is one of the longest, deepest and most stunningly decorated tombs in the Valley of the Kings. The walls are covered with remarkable images and ancient texts as well as scenes of Seti I accompanied by different deities. We were told that Seti's tomb is rarely open to the public these days, so we were really grateful for the opportunity to see this ancient monument in all its glory. What are your thoughts? I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> not far from the tomb of Seti is the burial place of Tutankhamun, who reigned Egypt between 1334 and 1325 BC. As you can see, it's much smaller and less extensively decorated than other Egyptian royal tombs of its time. However, unlike the other tombs in the valley, the mummy of the tomb's owner, Tutankhamun, is still on display in the tomb. Quite amazing. And whilst I do have some footage of the mummy, I decided not to include it on this film, just as a sign of respect. Wow, that was Tutankhamun. Incredible. Ramesses III was the second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. He's thought to have reigned from around 1186 to 1155 BC and is considered to be the last great monarch of the new kingdom to wield any substantial authority over Egypt. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in a conspiracy led by his wife Tai and her eldest son Pentaweer. He was succeeded by his son Ramesses IV, however, this event would ultimately cause a succession crisis, which would further accelerate the decline of ancient Egypt. It's thought that Ramesses I may have descended from a non-royal family before becoming the king of Egypt in 1292 BC. He was the founding pharaoh of ancient Egypt's 19th dynasty, and he was also the father of Seti I and grandfather of the great Ramesses II. Ramesses IV was the final tomb that we visited today. At age 21, he became the third pharaoh of the 20th dynasty of the New Kingdom and was the second son of Ramesses III. He came to the throne in difficult circumstances after his father was assassinated. Records suggest that he was the last New Kingdom king to engage in large-scale monumental buildings. Okay, we're back on the bus and we're heading to our final West Bank destination for the day, the Hatshepsut Mortuary Temple. The Hatshepsut story is an interesting one, especially given she was one of just a few female Egyptian pharaohs. 
She was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, ruling around 1478 until her death in 1458 BC. She married a half-brother Thutmose II, and that was quite common in those days. He had a child with another wife, and they called him Thutmose III. The child inherited the throne when his father died. However, given that he was only two years old, his stepmother, Hatshepsut, stepped in to rule as his regent. Several years into her regency, Hatshepsut assumed the position of pharaoh, making her a co-ruler alongside her stepson. The statues and images of Hatshepsut depict her as a male pharaoh through her physical looks as well as the clothes that she wears. And as with every column or statue in Egypt, there's always someone who wants to sneak out and show you something valuable. Later that afternoon, we made our way to the Karnak Temple Complex, the largest religious buildings ever constructed on the planet. Karnak is a city of temples and was built over a period of 2,000 years, spanning the Middle, New and Ptolemic periods. It was dedicated to the gods Amun, Mut and Khonsu. And despite its tumble-down appearance, it's still capable of overshadowing many wonders of the modern world and in its day must have been absolutely awe-inspiring. It comprises a vast mix of temples, pylons, chapels and statues across almost 200 acres. The complex is divided into four precincts, however, it's only the precinct of Amun-Ra that is available to the public to see. The third. Our tour guide Mohammed, who also just happens to be Egyptologist to the stars, was absolutely incredible. Born by Ra. Ra, Mrs. Born by the Ra. Ramesses and the name which was corrupted to be Ramesses. Nowadays, Heka the ruler of Luxor, who is loved, part participle, loved by Amun, E M N Ra, Amun Ra, Nib Nisu Tawi, the lord of the thrones of Upper and Lower Egypt and the land of Ibit Isut. At the heart of Karnak is the great hyperstyle hall a colossal forest of 134 giant sandstone columns commissioned by the 19th dynasty pharaoh Seti I. The Great Hall is vast. It covers an acre of land and its great columns soar to heights of 20 metres. The architraves on top of these columns are estimated to weigh 70 tonnes. The Avenue of the Sphinxes is a two kilometre pathway that connects the Karnak Temple complex to our next destination, Luxor Temple. It was built during the New Kingdom period around 1400 BC. We enter the temple through this massive 24 metre high pylon, which is decorated with images of Ramesses II's military achievements. The pylon was originally fronted by six colossal statues of Ramesses II. However, only three of these remain today. Of the original pair of pink granite obelisks that stood here, one remains while the other stands in Paris. Oh, 
and here we are in Luxor Temple, as you can see, lots and lots of columns. Towards the back of the temple is the sun court of Amenhotep III, and beyond this lies the hyperstyle hall. Whilst in Cairo, we based ourselves at the Hyatt Regency in Cairo West. It was a pretty good location, being just 30 minutes drive from the pyramids, the airport, as well as the Egyptian Museum. The rooms were super comfortable, the food was high quality, it had a massive pool, and they had entertainment on most nights. It's been at the top of our destination bucket list for as long as I can remember. Yet as we drive along the Fayyim Desert Road, I still can't believe the day is finally here. And to be honest, I actually feel a bit starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are in the Great uh, Pyramid in Giza, the biggest one. Pretty, pretty cool, eh? It's great. As we make our way into the complex, the Great Pyramid of Pharaoh Khufu towers above all that stands in its way. At 146 metres tall, it's the largest pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Constructed during the Old Kingdom around 2570 BC, the records show that it was the world's tallest human-made structure for more than 3,800 years. It was built by quarrying an estimated 2.3 million blocks just like these, weighing a total of 6 million tonnes. About 700 metres southwest of the Khufu Pyramid, is the pyramid of Pharaoh Khafre, who ruled Egypt between 2558 and 2532 BC. We're at Khafre's pyramid complex. It's going back to the fourth dynasty, which is about 2500 BC. At 136 meters high, it's the second tallest pyramid on the plateau. Blake offered to venture inside the pyramid so we could get some footage for this film. The chamber itself is quite small, about 14 by 5 metres, and contains the pharaoh's sarcophagus, which is made out of a solid block of granite. The roof is constructed of gabled limestone beams. Let's now check in with Blake and see if it was worth the effort. I think it's just the idea of that you've got being in a pyramid. Yeah, that's it's awesome. just so cool. Glad, glad I did. You took it funny. Yeah, yeah, this is good. The pyramid is quite well preserved, mainly because of an innovative construction method 
using a sheath of thin limestone blocks to cover the main structure. If you look closely, you can see evidence of this above our mate Bob Marley's head. Directly in front of Khafre's Pyramid is the Great Sphinx of Giza. The Sphinx is one of the world's largest sculptures measuring 73 metres long and 20 metres tall. Last stop here at the Pyramids and as you can see we've got the, the Sphinx up there. Actually much larger than I thought. It's pretty big and it stands quite tall. <laughs> According to some estimates, it would have taken a hundred workers about three years using some hammers and copper chisels to finish the statue. Ownership of the statue is still quite unclear. However, some say it bears a strong resemblance to the owner of the Great Pyramid, Pharaoh Khufu. About an hour's drive south of the Giza Plateau lies the archaeological site of Saqqara. This stony, barren landscape contains the ancient burial grounds of Egyptian royalty. It's also home to the earliest colossal stone building in Egypt, the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser. This magnificent funerary complex is believed to have been built somewhere between 2667 and 2648 BC at the beginning of the Third Dynasty. As we pass through the small antechamber, we enter the first of two hyperstyle halls comprising 40 limestone columns about 6 metres tall. We were told that this courtyard was used during the said festival. Apparently, if a pharaoh was still on the throne after 30 years, they were expected to prove their health by chasing a bull around the courtyard and catching it by the tail. It's hard to believe it's over four and a half thousand years old. If you look closely through this hole, you can see a small limestone statue of Pharaoh Djosa. And just off into the distance, you can see the outline of two other pyramids. Before driving back to Cairo, we made one more stop to visit the pyramid of Pharaoh Teti, who ruled Egypt between 2345 and 2333 BC. There's not a lot of room in here, that's for sure. Hard to believe we've actually done this. We've actually climbed inside one of the pyramids here at Saqqara. A 
About 15 minutes from Saqqara lies the village of Memphis. Founded in the First Dynasty around 3100 BC, Memphis was the oldest capital of ancient Egypt. We've travelled here to visit the Open Air Museum. We're here at the Memphis Open Air Museum. This giant alabaster sphinx is said to weigh more than 80 tonnes. And whilst this is amazing, I think the jewel in the crown for this museum is the limestone colossus of King Ramesses II. The statue is an incredible piece of work and is about 10 metres long. As we drive back to Cairo, we take some time to reflect on the 11 days we've spent in this spectacular country. What a privilege it's been to literally walk in the sandy footprints of those who were so instrumental in the foundation of our human race. Ancient Egypt has left a lasting legacy. Its art and architecture were widely copied and its antiquities were carried off to far corners of the world. You will see things here that you will only ever see in Egypt. Its monumental ruins have inspired the imaginations of travellers and writers for millennia. We can't wait to come back. Shukran, Egypt. Please help us grow the channel by subscribing and clicking the like button. You can also get a notification when our next film drops by simply clicking the notification bell. You obviously love travel as much as we do, so please have a look at a film we made on our recent trip to Rarotonga, a remote island right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Thanks for watching. And now, a final word from our tour organiser Mo. Shokran Gittan, Mr. Rick, <laughs> Rina, and Blake in Into Bituhina. Uh, it was. Can Kunt Mapsud Gittan Nana Shofku? We Said Gittan Gittan. We Atman Nana Shofku Maratanya. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey. Hey.